Hey guys, we're Alpha Quadrant 6, and this week we're going to talk about the best planets in science fiction. And I have a special treat for everyone here and for you guys. We're going to be visiting some of those planets right now. Mm -hmm. Jay, I didn't bring my passport. You don't need it. We're just going to go there. Can I take my helmet off as soon as we get there? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, then can I have a helmet? <laughs> we don't have any helmets. Can I get my passport? But here's the thing. No, we're going right now. You don't really need a helmet. This is why. Because most science fiction worlds are depressingly Earth-like. Same right? gravity. Yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, how, how often do you encounter an alien world that has something other than 1G? Right? I, I can't even think of any. I or know. they all look like they were filmed on Earth. Probably. Probably because they, they were. Well, in The Expanse, they, they handle gravity. And they do. That's, that's one of the few shows that actually deals with gravity. That's the exception. Right. But, yeah. but not the rule. Exactly. But... but I just think, look, we're going to have a little fun, we're going to travel around a little bit. Just go with the flow, follow my lead. Okay, Sounds here we go. Dangerous. Oh man, I thought the two suns was going to sell it, but this, this place sucks. One uh, more and we're on the pitch black planet. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a little dry. There's sand everywhere. You, know, you, know, you can smell the scum and It gets in your yeah. pants. <laughs> Alright, let's go somewhere else. Ready? All right. Oh, whoa, no, 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 no. Way too cold. Way too cold. <laughs> oh, those things are warmer on the inside. Tatooine again? Oh no. We're home side. So planet called the home side. Yep. Don't move. Nobody take a step. Okay, it's coming out. Oh! Oh! Ah. It's, it's beautiful! <laughs> 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 okay. Alright, this is good. This is yeah. better. It's nice. This is Earth. This looks like Earth. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. This, this is the Shorely planet in Star Trek, the original Ooh. series. Oh, wait, that one where like, okay, what they think of comes to reality? <laughs> yes, be careful. Right. Nobody think of any monsters from the Id. Oh, shit, now I can't think of anything except monsters from the Id. Right. Well, look, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get your mind off that, so I want to apologize. I'm sorry, guys. I thought we were going to be going and it'd be cool. Like, I didn't realize how dangerous this was going to be. I told you it was going to be dangerous. Why don't we go somewhere not too dangerous? Somewhere right. viable. I got it. Somewhere close to Earth. Close to Earth. We'll go to Mars. We'll go to Mars. Oh, no, no, Mars. Let's go. get our asses right. to Mars. Ready? All right. Okay, finally, we're back on Earth in our studio. <laughs> a little crazy I mean, there on our ship, right, right, on our whirlwind tour of sci-fi planets. So yeah, this is a, this topic has always intrigued me. Now, Brian, you and I have talked about this before. This is Brian, by the way. I'm Steve. This is Jay. This is Bob. Hi. Brian Trent is a science fiction, an award-winning science fiction author who's joining us on the show. And uh, we've had this conversation before how sci-fi planets are depressingly Earth-like. Yeah. They're just, they lack imagination. Same gravity. Always have oxygen. Mm -hmm. They don't have people take their helmets. Oh, it's got oxygen. Let me take my helmet off. Yeah, Without as if that's the only about. thing that they're, yeah. Exactly. Any <laughs> microorganisms one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about our favorite sci-fi planets, and then we'll talk, you know, also about this issue. Like, what are the, I like to think about what are all the variables? Because you have actually had to do this as a sci-fi author. Like, when you think of, like, I'm going to invent an alien planet. How could we make it different? Well, let's think about it. It's, it's how about the gravity? 1G, you know how few planets would have exactly 1G or anything that would feel exactly like 1G? I mean, 1G it makes to point, sense. You know, to 1.2. Historically, you know, we're talking about like shooting and, you know, to represent lighter or heavier or stronger or weaker gravity. It's hard, you know, so we just kind of assume yeah. that you know, there's, there's a lot of tropes like that that mm -hmm. are like aliens can speak English. You know, in Star Trek, they have the universal translator translating everything in real time. You know, Star Wars, I mean, almost everything speaks, you know, the common tongue, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. Um, that is basically the things that we have to give science fiction. But a lot of that come, dates back to the pulp days when instead of planets, they were just mysterious islands. Mm -hmm. And it was a backdrop. It was a jungle island or it was a desert island. So I just think it's time the sci-fi moved beyond that. When yeah. you have, especially now when we're, a plant, the planet finders are discovering so many interesting worlds, worlds that have cryovolcanoes, worlds that are tidally locked to the sun. To, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much out there and um, I think it's time for them to finally give us some more interesting uh, settings, especially yeah. since special effects can do anything now. Yeah. Right. Also, you, uh, yeah. So we could say that um, the limitations of budgets and special effects—that's why every planet has one G. Okay, but 
you don't need, a, it doesn't take a big budget to just say, okay, we need to have a little oxygen nasal cannula on this world, or we need to have a, just a face mask because there's too much CO2 on this world, or there's something that we, we gotta have a filter because we can't, you know, there's something you know, toxic uh, on this world, for example. Or again, how many planets would be in our comfortable temperature zone? Or, or how about tidal forces on that world could be massive. Even if the air pressure wasn't right, it could have, yeah, the, the, it could have the, a breathable uh, yeah. atmosphere, but without the air pressure being I mean, there. Air pressure, you could get away, like what's a livable air pressure for humans? Um, it's anywhere from about half of, a, of an atmosphere to a, a few atmospheres. So there's actually a pretty broad range there. Yeah. But you wouldn't instantly acclimate. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, half of an atmosphere, that's about the, the top of Mount Everest, right? Yeah. So people can obviously live up there, but that's like conditioned people. Right. Who, and then at that point, not because of the oxygen content, but because of the atmospheric pressure, you gotta use supplemental oxygen. Right. So you need all of these parameters have to be in a fairly narrow range for you to be able to walk around comfortably with no environmental suit or augmentation or Highly improbable. Right. So putting that aside as much as we can though, there are science fiction worlds that we love that, that, yeah. that have captured our, our imaginations. And I'll tell you what, I'll start with the one, because you were talking about um, this idea of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, when we go to the movie Avatar, mm -hmm. the movie Pandora has a poisonous atmosphere yeah. to humans. They did cover that, yeah. And I and love this is that. A hard science. This, was, this is a hard science movie as far yeah. as I, I mean, it's been a while, but they really did some, some science trying to make this as realistic as possible. And they did achieve that on many levels. They really thought, thought, did this thoughtfully and scientifically. And one of them was the, the, the atmosphere. A human could not survive. That's why you needed to be a 10-foot blue alien. I love that. I mean, I think it, it, the atmosphere became a character. Yes. It also became an obstacle. And it didn't ruin the movie. I mean, look, we understand that the creatures that live on Pandora can breathe the atmosphere. Right, they've but, evolved to those conditions. But the humans mm -hmm. couldn't. So there was many times that the atmosphere came up. And I loved it. I thought yeah. it was really cool. And then, you know, another, I'll give a shout out to Interstellar, which actually showed a planet. It's mm -hmm. the only one that I can think of that actually showed a planet where gravity was actually an issue. Yeah. Where it, it, it affected not just their experience on the planet, but it affected this, the flow of time, which was wonderful. And, and the see. tides were massive. Massive. Uh, the whole yeah. sequence is the standout for yeah, me. How, how often does, do, does gravitational time dilation impact a story? Almost uh, never. Yeah, once. Yeah. Right, but we're talking on the meter from fantasy like Star Wars all the way to hard science. Mm -hmm. You know, those are like the needle has to be in the red on the hard science side to see yeah. science facts Here, like Here's that. a variable we haven't even mentioned yet that should be different on every world. This spectrum of light put out by this, the, this star or stars on that world. It all looks comfortably Earth-like. Uh, but how often would you get a sunburn if you're on the wrong world? Or would everything look red or everything look be, have a hue? There was one episode I could think of off the top of my head one episode of Battlestar Galactica, the reboot, where they're mm -hmm. on a planet and they used a different sense of, you know, setting on the camera. So everything was kind of washed out yeah. to represent That's the awesome. fact that the world was just really bright. Yeah. In you Pitch know? Black, it had three different suns and they did something interesting with the camera where each time you're looking um, at one of the suns, they washed out the, the, the screen in a different, in a different color. Yeah. So you got these hues. That was, I thought that was kind of inspired. Right, uh, all right. So Bob, give me one of your planets. Well, uh, mine is, might be one of the most Earth-like in our list, and it was the, the shore leaf planet from Trek, the original series, and the animated. We just were the there. Animated we, we were just were there. there. Uh, Omicron Delta system, I believe. Mm -hmm. the, the name, I couldn't find the name, except the name kind of is the shore leaf planet. Right. That's what it was really mm -hmm. called. And so they go to this planet, very Earth-like. It's got a forested area. It's got open plains areas. It's got a desert area. So it's kind of diverse, but it's, it's, clearly, it's clearly Earth. And what mm -hmm. I now this is a it's a very um, Bob, hedonistic reason why we know I love why this. you like this planet. Of course, <laughs> think about it. This is meant to be an amusement an amusement park, an adult amusement an adult park. amusement park. Everything that you think of is quickly created. A planet wide and, holodeck and, and yeah. provided you. And, but but even better than a holodeck because this this isn't just constructed imagery and and a transporter you know matter. This is con these are constructed objects and the planet was built by advanced aliens, the entire planet. This isn't an evolved planet. This was a constructed planet for this purpose. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the ultimate planet to visit because <laughs> not only can you uh, live out your wildest fantasies, but I, I was surprised Spock didn't do things like, you know, talk to the caretaker, 
Yeah. Try to learn. Try to like ha think of something that would actually teach you some of the, the concepts that are used to create these. Because sure. remember, remember McCoy is like, I've never seen anything like it. And they did bring him back from death. I mean, yeah. from a type of death, cardiac that's, death that's or whatever good it was. Tech. So that's some good tech there. I mean, I want to try to walk away with some of that technology. So for those reasons, I think that's definitely a top five plan. Now, if I'm, if fascinating I'm, and fun, my God, what would you do? Well, here, here's, here's a, a, li do? a little, um, uh, you know, interesting negative spin on that type of world. There's a short story by Ray Bradbury called Mars is Heaven, where the astro astronauts land on Mars, and it's perfect Earth-like and everything like that, and they're running into their uh, family yeah. members who have passed, and they're Remember being that. served apple pie, and then they're going to bed at night, and that's when everybody's, all the Martians, the, 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 the people they've known reveal themselves as Martians, and they just, like wax, just melt down and reveal what they are and murder them in their sleep. Yeah. So they give them like one last hurrah. They, they, well, they, they give them to, to lull them they into a sense them. of security. Yeah. It's a trap. Yeah. It's a trap. I hate when that happens. <laughs> I, I remember watching that Star Trek episode, Bob, and, and I think if I, if I remember it correctly, didn't they say like this, no one can go to this planet anymore because it's kind of dangerous? No. No. They said short leave. They, they, oh, okay. His best short leave ever. Right, that's a construction. But memory. I do, yeah, I do, uh, I don't like it when I'm watching a, a sci-fi movie or show on an alien planet and it, it looks so Earth-like that it takes you out. Yeah. It's like, oh, come on, they, they just drove down the road and, right. and filmed that. I mean, it really... <laughs> so McDonald's in the background. You've got to you know? do something to make it look like you're on a different world. Right. Something. Even a funky plant or a funky bird. Do, yeah, I know. You got, or the soundscape or you got to do something. But, you know, it's like, that kind of, it's my backyard. You have no excuse with today's technology. Yeah. The, the things that I'm pulling off in the editing right. room just for this show, like uh, the things I'm learning about editing, like it, you could change the, the even on the cameras. Yeah. The technology is there. There's no reason for it to have to look exactly it's like It's a failure of the imagination yeah, at that point. You know, we move yeah. beyond the technical limitations. It's just about, don't get, how about not, not grass, not trees, something completely different. Mm -hmm. Something that isn't an animal or a plant, but something Different between. color vegetation. Different color vegetation. How about the weather? You know, yeah. it yeah. could be different. I, I like uh, Enemy Mine, the, the planet that most of the movie Enemy Mine took place <laughs> on, because yeah. it was that was a great movie. raining fireballs. All right, that's different. That doesn't yeah, happen that's on different. Earth. Yeah. How about a green sky and blue plants? More, you know. Yeah. Have any of you guys seen that movie recently? Does it hold up? Uh, not exactly. That would be a good one to redo. Could be. Yeah, that's no, a do no. for a redo. All right, so my planet. Yes. Arrakis. Dune. Dune. Desert planet. Desert planet. <laughs> and what I like about Arrakis, I mean, it's pretty monotonous, you know, in terms of a the planet bit. itself. A it's bit. just, it's, it's all. A lot of but Arrakis lot, has a secret. It's a lot of sand. Yeah. But, what, what I, and I've read the whole series. Yeah. You know, did you read the prequels at his son? Everything. Wrote, you know? I did. Everything. Fantastic. Yeah. Getting to, and the whole thing. The planet is a central character in that whole oh, yeah. story. One of the most detailed yeah. worlds yeah. ever created in science yeah. fiction. You think at, at first blush it's a desert planet, but actually there's so much hidden you know, history and depth and complexity there. Not just the Fremen, but also... The spice. The, the spice. The and, worms. And the sandworms and the ah. trout. You know about the trout. I know about yeah. the trout. And, and, throughout the, and the planet changes <clears throat> over the course of the, of the books yeah. as well. It changes as the story changes. So... It's got uh, an arc. The planet's yeah. got an arc. The planet itself has has a plot arc. So I like that about it. But you know, Dune is again, it's a, it's a desert planet, not that imaginative unto itself. But I like how integral it was to the plot right. arc of the whole franchise. And again, and the reason why it's a standout is not just because the story was fantastic, but because people don't do that to planets typically. Yeah. You know, it's it's pretty ballsy to have a planet be destroyed. Like I love that in you know episode four of Star Wars when. Uh, Leia's planet got destroyed. Alderaan? Yeah. I mean, even though, like, if you look back on it, like, the acting could have been, like, she could have been more upset a little bit longer than 30 seconds because everything she knew got destroyed. Have you ever destroyed. lost a planet, though? And no, maybe but how do you yeah. absorb you shut that? down. You get overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, pretty people are going to respond to that kind of thing. Today. It was ballsy. I like moves yeah. like that. I like when the, the landscape literally or really figuratively changing. changes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so my planet is the planet from the movie Alien. Mm -hmm. that the ship happens upon, which it yeah. didn't happen upon. The planet LV-426. Now, this oh, yeah. was the planet that the ship, uh, they find, you know, but we later find out that it was directed to by Ash, who is mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, a, what would you call him, Bob? An android? Skin job. A skin job. Um, now, that Replicate. planet, th that planet was devastatingly dangerous. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. that, the, the spacesuits that they had looked like, um, like underwater, like, 
like submariner mm -hmm. type suits. They were really bulky and heavy, and you felt claustrophobic for the actors, you know, for the characters. Then they're on the planet, and there's crap flying around everywhere. You know, then they that get was an alien world. Yes, that was a really lot. hostile alien world. And Steve, you made the point about you know Dune, Arrakis being a character. That was part of the character. That set yeah. everything in that movie was then set up. How the creatures look so alien, the ship looks so alien. It, it starts with that initial atmosphere. Humans aren't supposed to be here. Yeah, right. This is not your backyard or something. Right. And on top of that, you know, they, they they enter an alien world. They get back on the ship. The guys got the face hugger on, and then they 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 were supposed to go through. Um, you know, they had quarantine. quarantine, and Ash broke protocol mm -hmm. and let them in. Now, it was, I realized after rewatching the movie, like for the 300th time, because I love that movie, that they weren't just quarantined because of the alien thing, but because they were on a foreign planet, mm -hmm. which makes sense, which is yes. another cool thing. So, again, I think that supports the idea of having these worlds, like, let them be, let some of them be like Earth. Okay, I get it, but there should be some really harsh environments. In Star Wars, the harshest, the harshest environments we see are like, the, uh, the 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 planet where where Obi Wan and Anakin have their final battle, mm -hmm. the when, vo volcano planet, the volcano planet, or the anti Hoth, right? And that, mm -hmm. isn't that where Darth Vader ends up have, having his, you know, his base, like his his home base, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Which is it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing about that planet was they're breathing on it. It's a it, that world would be filled with unbreathable so atmosphere, yeah. pyroclastic, uh, yeah, eruption around them, and right. uh, they're just having a good duel. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you guys ever been to Hawaii? Yes. So walk around an active volcano. We're talking about a little bit of lava flowing, and like you're choking on the sulfur. You can't go there with asthma. Yeah, and the ground, the temperature of the ground, go, like it could be over 100 degrees. You're walking, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, yeah, the but heat. Yeah, Jay, but Jay, they were Jedi. Yeah. They could, yeah. They could that is one of the little known Jedi powers, extracting yeah. oxygen where there is no oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian, what do you got? Give us one of your planets. Um, I got a couple, actually. I'll go quickly. Um, there was, because I like to see something that's not Earth-like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do like um, Lusitania from uh, The Speaker for the Dead mm -hmm. uh, novel by uh, Orson Scott Tell Carter. Tell us about that. It's a very well-detailed ecology, very different. Not only were there three different intelligent species living on it, but there was a virus that was pivotal to the life cycle of one of the indigenous life forms. So it just it made it it made it feel different and a potential danger because this virus ever got out, it was lethal to people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would have to say uh, there was a novel written in the early '80s called um, *Flight of the Dragonfly*, and it's about a Roche world, two planets that share the same atmosphere. They orbit around each other, mm -hmm. and one world is rocky, one world is watery. Uh, regardless of the plausibility, that's just an interesting setting. So yeah. the right atmosphere away. was they were close enough for the atmosphere. You could take a you could take a plane. From one world uh, to I, the other. To one world to the other, wow. from a high enough peak. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's different. That's Talk about something yeah, unusual. Yeah, it's a different idea. I mean, I'm, yeah. not, I'm sure it could never really happen. There's a roast limit in, you know, uh, where I, one would start cracking up the other yeah. one. But right. I, I, it was, I know there's a series, I only read the first one, so I'm not sure how far they get into if it was placed that way to liberally arrange that way or whatnot. But it's, yeah. it was a unique and dynamic setting mm -hmm. um, that I've never seen anywhere else. And then uh, lastly, uh, Larry Nevin's Ring World, Ring World. Uh, which oh, is just oh extraordinary. God. It's not even a world. It's, not, you know? it's, it's, like, a, it's like a super world, right? It's like a it ring is a, world. It's a ring. It's a, the whole <laughs> planet. The, the Earth's uh, circuit around our sun is as, is as wide as this, as long as this thing is. Yeah, yeah. So it's a kind of um, version of a Dyson sphere. It's like a it's, Dyson it's a, ring. Yeah, it's, it's like a Dyson it's ring. The, it's it's a Dyson inspired hole. Halo and all that. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So to give you some idea, though, I... I read that book years ago, yeah. loved it, but I only remember snippets here and there. And one of the things I remember is if you were flying over it, uh, like in orbit over it at a very, very high altitude, and you would, one guy was flying around and he looks and he sees islands. Look at these islands. And uh, oh yeah, there's, this one's, this island is shaped like the America. This one, this island is shaped like Africa. And the, the scale was one to one. The island, that's how big the ring world was, yeah. that they had continents that looked like islands surrounded that by water. Awesome. Gargantuous. It was like Gargantuous. three million Earth's worth of mass or something like oh, that. It was God. like, yeah. Th there, were people, there were people that, if you imagine you're on a ring world and you look at the horizon, you will see, you will see like something that looks like an arch that goes up and all the way around. And this guy was like walking towards the end of the mm -hmm. arch, just like trying to find the, the end of a rainbow. He would walk forever, right? Because you're, you're, you're walking around and around. You're on the, the arch, so How to speak. How long would it take to, to circumnavigate to, the whole To thing? walk around the orbit of the Earth around the sun? Yeah, a long time. Yeah, I know um, <laughs> for people who play the Halo series, you can actually, they actually depict that, you know, for a first person perspective. You can see the ring just, you know, going sure, up yeah. into the sky. And it, again, it makes for a dynamic and, and interesting environment. So clearly we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> Bob, do you have another planet? Um, there was one that was just piques my interest, 
and it was Cybertron uh -huh. uh, from, from... Oh, the, yeah, Transformers, right? Man. And I'm not even a big Transformers fan. I love robots, but for some reason, Transformers never spoke to me. But the idea... Maybe because they're written for little kids? Yeah, could be, could be. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of them, and, and the movies don't even get me you started like on the movies. You like robots over Transformers, oh, right? Robots <laughs> in the um, But I like, no, I just generally love robots. And this is a, a basically a robot planet. What's yeah. not to love about but a robot planet? do you know the history planet? of that yeah, Primus? Yeah. Primus, yes. Primus is like, his shape, his form was a planet. I mean, so it, no, but do you know what? When you the, the real history is that that planet was made by aliens to build robots, and then somehow the, those aliens no longer were there, and the robots just became sentient and started to take over. So mm -hmm. they, that is a planet filled with sentient robots. So it's yeah, a factory that, that becomes alive. Right, right. that much mm -hmm. I knew, and that's what, that's why I love it because it's basically a robot planet. So what's now that not you to brought love? it up, I have a question for you, okay. Bob. Since you now ruled Transformers in this discussion, who knows the most about Transformers here? <laughs> I have a question for you. Okay. How the hell did they know what trucks looked like on the Earth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, apparently, they love our 60s and 70s technology. Right. <laughs> it's the clear, no, er, 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 terrestrial vehicles are the fifth fundamental force of the universe. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's dark matter and energy combined. It's Optimus Prime. But it is, it is a, a really provocative idea that, yeah. that whoever came up with that. Like, I love the idea that it, the, that one layer deep, and this will be transitioned into my next planet very well, but okay. the people who made the planet, who are they? Why, where are they? Mm. What, what happened to them? Just like on uh, Altair 4, mm -hmm. which was from the planet from Forbidden Planet. Now, not, we've the, talked about this. The movie, Krell. The Krell Big technology. Fan. We, fan. we love this movie. This movie is fantastic. It's one of the oldest, best science fiction right. movies. Yeah. 50s. Not, and but it's still It's still up. great. It's still, it's still great. Or something. Yeah. It still does. I mean, a remake could be incredible, yes. but, yeah. probably, but it well, probably wouldn't be though. But we don't need it because the but movie is be. still that good. That's exactly the kind of movie we do want to remake because the story is fantastic and the production value is 1950s. There's definitely room for improvement. Only if it could be improved, though. I'm, I'm afraid of Hollywood getting its hands on it yeah. and just doing. I can only think of three or four remakes that I've ever enjoyed from the speculative fiction genre, and I just see it going wrong too easily. Me too. I see the, the exact kind of directors yeah. we don't like grabbing out of that yes. project. But, yeah. but to continue, why is that planet cool? One, the ancient Krell. Yeah. The Krell are yeah. dead. It's They're history. gone. We don't know who they are. They've left this in unbelievable network of, of machinery underground. Um, but that wasn't like that was that was like the gener uh, uh, energy generating part mm -hmm. of their world. That wasn't like the, the fusion reactors. Yeah. yeah. But the surface of the world was a utopia, and they can have whatever they want just by thinking about it, which is very similar to the Star Trek thing. As a matter of fact, it's very very similar to the Star Trek idea. Which, but but this came first, so I wonder who uh, yeah, was inspired by a decade. Um, and maybe, also maybe even a little bit more advanced, um, based on what little they reveal about it. It seemed mm -hmm. like on, in Forbidden Planet, they, it was cr it was created and like beamed to you, whereas on the Shoreley Planet, it was. Constructed, and then they they walk right. over to you, or whatever. But the, although the crawler were apparently too dumb to turn off the machine, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once they realized what was happening, it was too late. Um, <laughs> they've gone it, too it, far. It, it, it. But the, the the other thing is, is that planet. <laughs> the moment the ship lands on it. The sound effects and everything yes. set it up, but it's yeah. creepy. There's it something creepy, creepy about it's, it. It's, it's a paradise, but, it's, but it's, it's an earthly paradise set against a clearly exotic setting. You know what we you know what we have to do though is we have to look at this planet like. It's a fallen utopia, mm -hmm. and there, there, that we should come up with a word about a fallen utopia. A dystopia. Because, dystopia? A, well, no, no, no. <laughs> post-apocalyptic. No, 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 no. Not even post-apocalyptic. Like I get what you're saying because I guess you could call it a post-apocalyptic world, but it is still functioning as a utopia. But it's a failed it's utopia. It's a ghost utopia. It's a ghost utopia. There's something yeah. about it that's not right, and that's why you know they they use the theremin for the music, yeah. not just because everybody was using a theremin, but the, the people who wrote the music for that, the theremin was the perfect instrument because it just mm -hmm. had that alien thing. That's it, it almost had a voice behind that, it. Yeah. It represented oh the God. Krell. They land on it. It was weird. The, the first thing they see is ro this weird smoke trail coming up to them. It was Robbie the Robot yeah, yeah, tearing yeah. ass on that cart they, that What I love about that movie, among many things that I love about it, is the way they slowly just they introduce one um, exotic thing after another, introduce, and then they move on to the next one. So it's a descent into the history and the culture mm -hmm, of this world yeah. and all that, right? And you're acclimating into it. By the time they give the, hit you with the reveal, you're already fully embedded. Oh, totally in invested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end, when, when you, you're learning about the Krell from Morbius, and you're just like, oh my God, this is so cool and everything. But then you find out, like, he's possessed by the, them, mm -hmm. by the Krell and their technology. Oh my God. It's not just the story, though. The planet Great movie. itself. Great movie. How about a prequel? I said this in a previous show. Brian doesn't like the prequels, remakes. Yes. I, just, I want it. 
Yeah. Because if it sucks, okay, it sucks. You never watch it again. But if it's good, if it's great. I had this bad but dream about a prequel to Alien, guys. though, and I, I can't shake that nightmare I had. <laughs> so that's scary. Uh, that sounds yeah. scary. The problem is, thank God nobody ever tried that. <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in the Krell. I think the Krell are, are amazing. But yeah. Brian, I talk to Brian. I tell sometimes I'll call Brian and tell him about our latest show because I like to talk with him because he's a science fiction writer. Um, and Brian said, "Nah, we should never see the Krell, right? We should never." No, no, they, no you know, they would do. Better. They would, exactly. They would. Turn, when I think of the, the Krell, I think of something not only inhuman in scale, but inhuman in in, in appearance, Everything. almost something Lovecraftian. I don't want yeah. them to be rendered as as large buff albinos, um, yeah. as you know, as that horrible dream I had about the <laughs> alien prequel. Yeah, I so right. I want them to stay alien and stay off screen because as you're, it is that even the monster from the id. You don't really see don't it really exactly. See it. Yeah. exactly. Sure, you get a good you idea. You get a good look, but it's I mean, like, even it's like so, a big it's, lion. it's no, just but, enough to be freaky. It's not just a big lion, because Morbius, when he was asleep earlier in the show, he, that creature snuck onto the ship. And it, it, it had a, steps. It had a bird claw. Yep. Remember, they took a, a, a mold mm, of its right. foot. It was like a, it was a, a sloth right. slash, yeah, this yeah, is an arboreal creature. But right. This, yeah. right, but, uh, but I think you get the right guy behind the project. With CG or animation these days, I, I could say it I could, could be great, it. and it could suck. I mean, right. yeah, we just don't know. As, I'd roll as the dice. any movie, as in as I think any I, movie. But I think odds are much more likely that it would be a disaster. You have to see, you have to have somebody who who truly loves and even worships the original, and has the willingness to rein their CG team in and say, you know what, we're not going to overdo this. We're going to show glimpses of it. We're going to pull more of a Jaws, the shark and Jaws kind of thing, where it's not on screen too much. But that's not the, the, that's not the CG yeah. team. That that's the people that fund the movie. Of course, or, of course, or, of course. But it's also the director. Has to say that's it's enough. Stop the director. All yeah. right, my planet. My next planet is actually two planets because Bob came up with one and I came up with another. They were basically the same concept: Trantor or huh. Coruscant. Nice. So Trantor is from, the from Asimov, from his yeah. Foundation series, yeah. from his Robot series, and there was even another series. That, uh, I think Currents of Space or some they, other they, series. They, they kind of joined them back all together. Uh, or Coruscant from Star Wars. But so both are similar in that they're it's a it's a worldwide city, right? The, yeah. the entire planet is one. Continu contiguous city, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting thought experiment. So if you have a galaxy-wide civilization, yeah. that you, would, you could imagine the capital of that galaxy would be a, that pl an entire planet, and, if, and it would evolve to be like every, every you know, a building space would be incredibly right. valuable, so they would eventually would build it up. But logistically, how could you sustain a world like well, that? Well, right. I mean, you're talking about urban sprawl on a planetary scale. Yeah. So, I mean, they must, where are they growing their food? Uh, yeah, so like, they talk about it. For yeah. Chantour, they grow a lot of their food there because there's lots of levels under, under the surface. Mm -hmm. They grow a lot of their own food, but they also need 25 other planets in, in nearby systems to grow that food for them. 25 summer farm planets. planets 25 yeah. planets that are devoted to that. Do they say how many people are on the planet? 45 billion at, at its peak, 45 billion. Which was a good number till I heard of uh, the, the chorus guys are more like a trillion. It's like a trillion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah and I was I was watching a YouTube show where people were scientists were talking about the resources that mm -hmm. people would need and the amount of heat that the typical person generates. Not just their body heat, but it's more about the electronics that they use sure. and all that. And they yeah. said that they would have to be. Of course, it's fantastic future technology, yeah. but. It would we, be, we, with our technology today, could not support a planet like that. In fact, with seven and a half billion people, we're getting we're pushing up against our limitations on growing food. That's right. You have to think maybe 10 billion. Where are we going to cap out? I mean, you never know. Like, we're going to have to keep pushing the technology. With present day technology, we can't grow our population indefinitely. We right. need to increase the technology as we increase our population. And yeah, we're going to need to farm Mars or just have you know stations yeah. or farm the oceans or have mm -hmm. multiple levels. But also where we a bunch of O'Neill cylinders yeah. that'll be but devoted we, to growing food yeah. in orbit. But we'll be growing. We'll be making food in the lab. You know, but yeah. anyway. But the, I think too. You know, keeping in mind, like I wouldn't want to live on a city planet. No, I wouldn't. You know, I like I like my way. you know forest. Yeah, I want to go Walden when I. That's when what I your need holodeck to. is for. Yeah. <laughs> but that is true. Just psychologically, what would it be like to live on a city planet? I mean, you know, well, you do 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 sociological studies of people who live in like, uh, you know, Hong Kong or you know, yeah. Tokyo and like places where you know they don't see a lot of nature in in the city itself. Yeah. it's very hyper industrialized. Um, I mean, I know it's just in the real world. I went to uh, we went to London mm -hmm. last October. Um, and I was shocked at how many trees are in London, and it's it, it's unbelievable how many trees mm -hmm. they have in London versus New York. We walk, you know, you're in New York. There's places, lots of places in New York where like you're in a concrete world. Yeah. Um, 
So and, look, and Central Park stands out yeah. like this big green right. posted stamp, and yeah. then it's surrounded by right. you know. The, I remember reading about over 100 years ago when they they brought one of the, you know an American Indian to Central Park, and like oh to, to impress the Indian, like look at look at uh, look what we have here, and he's like. Wow, you, you even put your trees in, in reservations. How sad. <laughs> yeah. And if you like the show, you can like us, you can subscribe to us, you could leave a comment. We would love to hear what you have to say about the, our review. What planets did you, do you think that we missed? Uh, but please do like the show because that'll help other people find us. And guys, there, this episode has a sister episode to it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? Because Brian is going to join us for our next episode, which is going to be about AI. Go to alphaquadrant6.com. That's the number six dot com to find out everything there is about us. Guys, we we went to different planets together today. We almost died a few times. A few it was times. A bit scary. Bob, was you a passed scary. out. What the hell? Uh, What's with your constitution, uh, man? I'm still cold. <laughs> <laughs>